Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I promise a very special program and conversation uh, for you today. I just wanted very quickly to remind you, can you please silence uh, your cell phones? And uh, in order to set the stage for the conversation we're going to have with uh, Mr. Zachary Wood, uh, uh, bear with me, I would like to say a few words uh, introducing him. So, Zach Wood was an assistant curator at TED, as well as a former columnist and assistant opinion editor at The Guardian. He was a Robert Bartley Fellow at The Wall Street Journal and graduated in 2018 from Williams College. He's a young man. <laughs> <laughs> His recent work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Huffington Post, The Nation, The Weekly Standard, Times of Higher Education, and Inside Higher Ed. Wood's book, Uncensored, is a memoir. It is a fascinating account of a young man's triumph over extremely, extremely difficult circumstances. In addition to being thoroughly enjoyable, this book, in my opinion, provides many insights into the education of disadvantaged students. And of course, in a narrow polarization in our nation, I think Zach has some important things to say to all of us. In the words of former US ambassador to the United Nations and National Security Advisor, Susan Rice, uncensored is honest and compelling and triumph of discipline and resilience. On the front cover of uncensored are words that capture the essence of this book. My life in uncomfortable conversations at the intersection of black and white America. Wood's book is an intensely personal account of his struggle to achieve success in face of poverty and racism. Reading the book, you can't help but to root for him all the way. But there is much more to his story than a triumph over adversity. Zach examines insights into big issues such as institutional racism, mental illness, and education. His book is peppered with astute observations about the range of topics like basketball and orthodontics. <laughs> At Williams College, Wood was president of a group that he called Uncomfortable Learning, a student group dedicated to bringing speakers, offering different viewpoints from those found at his school. His first invite, do you know who was? Suzanne Venker, an anti-feminist who claims feminists are waging war on men. The next person to be invited, he asked John Derbyshire, who defends white supremacy. Needless to say, both speaking invitations trigger an uproar and demonstrations at Williams College, and of course, personal attacks on Zachary. Both talks were canceled. Eventually, Zach found someone who did speak at Williams. That speaker was Charles Murray, author of The Bell Curve. Murray attributes racial IQ achievement gaps to genetic inferiority and other impediments holding back black communities. So Wood's experience with a comfortable learning at Williams illustrates one of the most important issues facing institutions of higher education today, the erosion of freedom of speech. Many believe colleges and universities are not bastions of free speech, 
when it comes to ideas unpopular on today's largely liberal campuses. In fact, many conservatives say today's college students are in the liberal bubbles of their campuses. So, Zach, it is clear that you don't agree with Venker, Derbyshire, or Mary. I agree with them on everything. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, you did have the courage to invite them to Williams to speak. Why? So, part of my perspective was that in order for us to work together, I think, I believe that the way we achieve progress as a society, legislatively, right, when we look at bills that get passed, major legislation that has changed the lives of many Americans, millions of Americans, part of what enables us to work together is when we are able to find common ground. Now, sometimes the common ground that we are able to find is very limited. When I was a sophomore in college, Donald Trump had ascended. And I was very surprised by it. But what I said to myself was that in order for us to make progress, we have to listen. If we're not listening, we're not gonna be able to gain a deeper understanding of perspectives with which we're less familiar. And so for me, I was thinking about fundamentals. If I want to understand the complexities and the ambiguities and the shades of gray, I have to delve into these interactions, not just intent on making my point firmly and persuasively, but on trying to listen, on trying to recognize that an entirely different set of experiences, a different set of conversations at the dinner table, a different friend group, a different background can lead to a very different view of the world. It doesn't make someone else any less intelligent or any less capable. It just means that their experience of being in America has been very different from your own. My view was that if we wanted to work together, if we want to achieve change at a time in which our country is deeply divided, we've got to listen to each other. We have to listen to those we disagree with, and we have to try our best especially when it's difficult, to engage thoughtfully and tactfully. That was my reasoning. Now, in the book, uh, you also describe the dinner you had with Mary. Yes. <laughs> you want to share that with yes. us? Yes. So how had, it was, what kind of experience that was? <laughs> I had dinner with Charles Murray, and yeah, I dealt with some challenges in my life. And I thought, you know, this, is, this might not be the most enjoyable dinner that I've had. <laughs> uh, and so I was preparing myself. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd read his work closely. I'd listened to a few of his public lectures. I had my set of questions that I wanted to, to ask. I was prepared to listen intently. And I've got to say, it was a very pleasant interaction. He was very cordial. He was very kind. Now, we did not agree on much. <laughs> we, we didn't admire the same figures, the same political leaders, right. the same activists. Our vision, this was one thing I recognized from the conversation I had with him. One thing we had in common was that we both genuinely wanted America to be stronger. We were both proud of the fact that America is the greatest democracy on earth. We both took pride in that. We wanted America to be even better to grow stronger, but our vision of a more just society, of a stronger nation, differed vastly. We talked about presidents, we talked about policy, we talked about welfare, we talked about affirmative action, we talked about health care. And what I found from that conversation was that you can have people who are well-informed, who are highly motivated, who are interested in understanding issues, who are both genuine in their intent, reach very different conclusions of what we should be pursuing as a society. That was what that interaction taught me. Okay. okay. Um, all of us uh, this week are mourning the tragic loss of uh, basketball legend Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna and of course seven other people that were on the helicopter. And Zach, uh, you talk about Kobe Bryant in your book. 
And as a matter of fact, I'm quoting you, reading about Kobe Bryant in particular inspired me, you say, to commit to everything I put my mind to, the way he committed to basketball. Kobe has always been my favorite basketball player. His coach, Phil Jackson, said that if he set the bar at seven, Kobe would raise it to nine. So you want to tell us about Kobe, but also I would love to hear from you why basketball is so important to young black children. Absolutely. First on Kobe Bryant. My favorite athlete of all time. And the reason why is because this was a guy who structured his entire life around being the very best basketball player he could be. What his legacy really means to me is when I look at it, I see someone who was determined to be the very best that he could be at what he loved doing, at what he was passionate about. He worked with Nike to shave millimeters off of his sneakers so that he could spin faster on a fadeaway jump shot. This is a guy who only ate lean meat, who had a polyphasic sleep schedule, which meant that he would take two hour naps three times a day rather than sleeping for any extended period of time, just so that he could work out two to three times a day. We know that he died in a helicopter crash. He would take over the past eight years, the last eight years of his career, he traveled by helicopter to all of his games because he understood that his first responsibility in this world was being a father. And so he did not want to sacrifice family time for the commitments that he had to being the best basketball player that he could be. And so he said, you know what, I can, I can get around the LA traffic if I just take a helicopter. So this was someone who was determined to do everything that he possibly could to structure his life around being the very best athlete that he could be. I respect his intensity, his competitiveness, his work ethic more than anything. And I think when it comes to basketball and the role that it plays in African American communities across the country, part of the way I understand it is that everyone, everyone wants to, to find joy in life. Everyone wants to find meaning. Everyone wants to have a sense of purpose. <clears throat> And often when you're in underprivileged, disadvantaged communities, basketball becomes your world. It becomes this place where you can compete, where you can work hard, where you can earn respect. We all care about earning respect, about being respected, about feeling validated. And in communities that face significant economic disadvantages and social disadvantages, in which you may not always have two parents in a home, Basketball is understood, is felt, is seen as not just this recreational activity, but as something where it's honor, it's dignity, it's yep. hard work. It's something that you can take pride in. Yep. Bravo. Um, Zach, uh, your mother was mentally ill, but she was also quite a remarkable woman, well-educated, and very determined that you receive an education and be successful. So do you want to describe her for us? I know you spent quite some time in the book describing your mom, and uh, both the good and the bad, and how she affected you. My mother is without doubt the most significant person, the most significant influence on my life and who I am today. She had incredible soft skills. She was a people person. She could talk to anyone, connect with anyone, could understand anyone. She understood what motivated people, what gave people joy, what their intentions were, what they were trying to achieve. And yet at the same time, she had schizoaffective disorder, which meant that she had symptoms of schizophrenia and bipolar, mood swings, paranoid delusions. And at any given time, with or without reason, she could be very angry and her rage was terrifying. 
she could be very sad and feel depressed and question whether anyone loved her. And so part of what this meant for me as a child, any kid is going to want to have a positive, nurturing, encouraging relationship with their mom. And it was, there was a sense in which I was always fighting for that, trying to achieve that, but didn't really fully feel it, didn't really have it. Because every day I would wake up and I wouldn't know, is it going to be a good day or a bad day? Is she going to be upset today or is she going to be happy today? Is this going to be a day where she wants to watch movies and go to the arcade? Because when she wanted to have fun, she wanted to have right. a lot of fun. Right. And so it made me more compassionate. It made me more empathetic. Another significant thing about my mother, I grew up in a family of educators. She grew up in a family of educators. My grandmother was a teacher in Detroit Public School for 42 years. She taught me how to read when I was three. And my mom, and this is very important, she always encouraged me to explore my curiosity. I asked a lot of questions as a kid. <laughs> I mean, about the why and how of like everything you could, you could imagine. And I would hope for a good five minute answer and sometimes it would be an hour answer. Yeah. <laughs> and this was valuable for me because this is what sparked and spurred yeah. my love of reading and right. my love of writing and my desire to really take on different intellectual and cognitive challenges. And so in that way she played an incredibly important right. role in right. furthering my own yep. education. When, uh, Zach, when uh, child uh, protective services intervene and uh, uh, to remove you from your mother's uh, care, you had to move to Washington, D.C. to be with your dad. Do you want to, uh, and uh, you also described that this was a huge challenge for you. Do you want to tell us why? Yes, and so, I mean, my mother had this mental illness, and when she was angry, it was never pleasant. It was one of the most challenging things I've ever had to deal with was my mother's anger. And at about the age of 14, I reached the conclusion, after talking to a school guidance counselor, school psychologist, that it was not healthy. It was not best for me to continue living with my mother that I would not be able to develop into the young man that I was, that I wanted to be, that she genuinely in her heart wanted me to be. And so I had to move to DC to live with my dad and Child Protective Services made the recommendation, but here was the significant difference. When I lived with my mom, in terms of our financial circumstances, materially, we were about lower middle class. There were challenges, she had to budget at times, she had a gambling addiction, and that made things more difficult. But everything that was essential that I really needed, 90% of the time I had it. My dad, on the other hand, lived below the poverty line. A home that was in utter disrepair with five people, my grandmother, my uncle, me, my dad, and my sister. And so moving to D.C. in one of D.C.'s rougher neighborhoods meant that I now have to make this transition and I didn't want to go to a public school in the area because I didn't know the kids, I wouldn't fit in, and there are a whole host of other challenges that you're going to face in an under-resourced community. And so I had to code switch, I had to reconnect, I had to reacclimate myself, I had to be open and circumspect at the same time. And it made me more resilient and it made me stronger, but that move from Detroit to D.C. at the age of 14 was certainly probably the most significant challenge I've faced in my life to this point. I see. And uh, how did your dad influence you in spite of all the challenges Absolutely. to adjust to that environment? The most salient <coughs> memory, the most salient characteristic about my dad is his work ethic. Since fourth grade, I've had the good fortune to have attended private schools. So coming from disadvantaged communities, the public schools were not that great. But private schools are expensive, and my family did not have the money. And so I was very fortunate to receive considerable financial aid, but this is one thing that's often underreported. Even though I received considerable financial aid, paying that 700 a month was still very tough 
for my family. And my dad would work two jobs and three jobs, at times four, doing valet after work, delivering newspapers from 2 to 5 a.m. in the morning, then being an accounts payable coordinator by day. And so his work ethic it was incredible. underscored yeah. for me the importance and the value of hard work. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you mostly attended uh, elite uh, private schools. And uh, you also received merit scholarships. Yeah. Not athletic scholarships. Yes. Yeah. Although all your white peers, they thought you were on an athletic scholarship. Basketball or football. <laughs> or, you know. Those are the questions you were yes, getting, yes. right? Are you on a football scholarship or a basketball one? But actually it was merit scholarship. Yes, absolutely. So how were you able to do this? And uh, are these lessons for others to learn? Are there, I'm sorry, lessons for others to learn? Absolutely. I mean... Part of it for me was the emphasis that my family placed on education, that my mom placed on education, that my grandmother placed on education. And one of the big lessons I learned from my experience in private schools was that there were many differences between me and my peers, significant differences, racial differences, class differences. Just if you look at our spring, ba spring break vacations, they were going to Aspen and <laughs> You know, tours of Europe. I'd never been out of the country. I went to Canada once or twice, but I was in Detroit, so it was right across the water. <laughs> and they're going to China and Beijing, and they're telling me about all this, and I'm like, wow, this is incredible. What it taught me is that our differences matter. <coughs> our differences are significant. It's a part of what makes us individuals. It's a part of our individuality. Our creativity matters, our uniqueness matters, and we all have unique journeys. But at the end of the day, I think our common humanity matters more. And what I learned was that there were things that I could find in common with my peers, a love of reading, a love of writing, a love of speaking, yeah. an interest in different subjects. Yeah. That's why I'm here today. Yep. You mentioned, uh, Zach, in your book, affirmative action yes and writing that there are significant moral and social costs mm -hmm. associated with it would you care to expand on that absolutely so i was in fourth grade i was reading <laughs> i was reading a book and i came across this phrase affirmative action <laughs> it's a typical experience hey, you read it and i say okay i'm going to ask my mom what this means because <laughs> i have no idea what affirmative action what is affirmative action and i'm trying to think what does this really mean so i asked my mom and i was i was really hoping for like a concise kind of <laughs> in a nutshell it was like, like i think two hours <laughs> and i was raised in a family of progressive democrats but this i remember this vividly my mom took great pains to really emphasize that with any issue that matters, any issue in the public sphere, any issue that you hear discussed in the news, that you read about in editorials in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post, any issue worth thinking about, worth reading about, worth discussing is complex. People's stories, people's lives are complex. And so she went through the many benefits and the many costs with affirmative action, the advantages and the disadvantages, acknowledging that while it can create unique and meaningful opportunities for some, for disadvantaged minorities, it can also disadvantage others. And so while she told me that she was ultimately a proponent of affirmative action, that she supported it, she said there are legitimate reasons to have concerns, to have reservations. She explained that there are different forms of affirmative action that having geographical diversity matters, that having socioeconomic diversity matters, that having gender diversity matters. And so what I walked away with was a greater appreciation, a deeper appreciation of the complexity of the issues right. of the day, right. the issues that matter most to us, that really affect our lives. How do you feel about affirmative action today? Today. Now. I'm a supporter of affirmative action, but sensible affirmative action, sensible, 
reasonable affirmative action. I believe in giving people who are disadvantaged socioeconomic diversity, I think, is important. I believe that for a college to have a goal, for various institutions and corporations to have a goal of having people within those institutions that are more representative of America, I think that's a good thing. But I think we have to be responsible and we have to be sensible with it, right? right. We do have to consider qualifications and credentials. We have to consider personalities and interest. But ultimately, I am in favor of having greater diversity. Right. I think right. it allows us to have better discussions, right. a deeper understanding, a more rich understanding, and ultimately to make a greater difference in the lives right. of others. My next question is very close to my heart. Uh, you write that many private schools value diversity mostly for its promotion of value. Uh, you think they should be more generous with financial aid for disadvantaged minority students, such as yourself. This is a subject, of course, very close to my heart. And as I explained to you, uh, as provost and president of USC, I did brag about uh, the improvements we made in uh, uh, recruiting underrepresented minority students. And today, 25% of the undergraduate student population is underrepresented minority. But do you want to give us specifics on how schools can do better in this area? Yes. First, I want to say 25%. That's something to be proud of. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 25% is really good. It's, you know, it's a complicated topic. I, I mean, I think one thing that I'm happy about is that I think in the last, I'd say the last decade or so, <clears throat> diversity itself, having a diversity with, when it comes to race and class and gender, geographical diversity, is now something that's on the minds of administrators in a way that it wasn't in 1980 or 1990. I think that's a positive development. Right, right. Part of what I'm getting at in my book when I say that it's about the pro promotional value is that you know, any really good boarding school, college you go to, they have these brochures when you go into the admissions office. And if you've got great diversity, you should be proud of it. But part of what I'm getting at in the book is that it's not just about the promotional value and it doesn't end with just having the students there attending. I think we have to make meaningful inroads in terms of helping students feel more included, to feel like they belong, to feel like they can make the most of their education. I mean, I, I loved learning. I loved reading. I loved writing. I loved speaking. And because of a number of teachers who played a critical role in my intellectual development, I felt empowered to make the most of my education. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, I recognize that every student right. doesn't have those same right. circumstances, those same advantages. And so I think that beyond just achieving the diversity itself, having a more representative student body, we have to think about what inclusion really means in a way that is sensible, in a way that is strategic. Yep in a way that is consistent, I believe, with also having robust and open discussion of difficult ideas. Yep. Uh, you got my attention, uh, Zach, in the book when you wrote that most people don't understand how expensive it is to be poor. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, yeah, so part of, uh, part, part of the challenge is when you have limited resources, everything feels even more expensive than it is because it's not like you have a real savings. I mean, this was part of the challenge when I was in high school. My dad was working three, at times four jobs, valet after work, accounts payable coordinator by day. After valet, he was delivering papers when he had a car, because through most of high school, he did not have a car. When he had a car, he started doing Uber. And just to do Uber, you have to have a car that is in shape to do right. Uber, exactly. right? And so everything, every expense, every payment, for instance, braces. Now I have a, I have a decent <laughs> smile. In high school, I needed braces. That's, it's very expensive. Every payment was, expensive. was putting us further in debt because he didn't have the money. 
So if you don't have a savings, that's one thing I think we don't think about. If you have a savings, you've got a savings. If you have money that's saved, it's there. You're prepared to use it if need be. When, you, when your balance is near zero, through most of my time in high school, my dad's account balance was yeah. never much over zero. And so every expense felt taxing. It was challenging. And so because of that, just being yep. poor is very expensive. You're always digging yourself out of a hole. You also talk in your book about code switching. Yeah. Do you want to explain that for us? So it's interesting. Yes, code switching. You mentioned the word already in the yes, conversation. Yes, yeah. Co code switching. <laughs> um, it's interesting because when people talk about code switching, sometimes it's, understood as a difference between how people of different backgrounds or different races communicate. But I really think it's a lot broader than that. I think we all code switch. And I'll give you an example. The way I would talk to my best friend is different from how I talk to my grandmother. Right? I mean, it's, it's going to be different. That's code switching. The way I would talk in a job interview Uh, yes, I want to do this for this. <laughs> It's very different from how I'm going to talk maybe to someone at a, a cocktail yeah. reception or on a first date. It, it's just different. So we, what we don't realize is we're code switching all the time. Sometimes we're thinking about it more yeah. actively. Sometimes we aren't. But really what code switching is, we all, I believe, as human beings, have a desire to connect with other people. It's part of what sustains us, right, is the relationships that we have with family, with friends. We want to connect, and in order to do that, sometimes we have to modify our own behavior. When, uh, when you were in school, you also engaged in respectability politics. Yes. Or trying to earn the respect, as you say, of your white peers and leaders. Do you think this is really unique to black people? It's a good question. I think... I mean, you, what about other minorities? I, I think any, in any circumstance, even if, if the minority is just someone, you know, people who have conservative views in a space that's predominantly liberal, any minority is going to face certain challenges under any circumstances in terms of making sure that their voice is heard, feeling like they have a seat at the table, feeling able to communicate. One of the challenges that I encountered in college was that I, you know, I wanted to build relationships across cultural and political differences. Mm -hmm. And though I came from a family of progressive Democrats, I really wanted to understand what people thought with whom I disagreed. I wanted to gain a deeper understanding of conservative and libertarian views. And so I think that any minority in any situation is going to face certain challenges. When it comes to race, because the most significant racial divisions we have in this country tend to be between black and white, I believe there's, there's a sense in which the broadest lens right. is that respectability politics is going to apply most to someone who is African American, who is in a predominantly white environment, who feels as though they have to dress a certain way and, and comport themselves in a certain way to be respected and acknowledged and validated and to succeed. And so I think that respectability politics can play out in different ways yeah. with any minority in any circumstance, but we're probably discussing it most in terms of black and white because that's right. in terms of racial challenges, tensions and divisions. But that Zach, is the most history. How about the reverse? Whites who want to earn the respect of blacks in such fields as rap music or basketball. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, um, yes. Do they I have mean, to engage in respectability politics? Yes. I mean, it, let's, this term respectability politics sometimes can seem a little abstract and vague. What is it really? Okay, so let's simplify it. Who doesn't want to be respected? Right. Who doesn't want to be heard and seen and validated? If you are the only one who is from a certain place or the only one who looks a certain way, it can be race, it can be someone who's disabled, any significant difference that makes you feel like okay, you're, not, you're not a part of the majority. 
Right. You don't fit in as easily. As human beings, we're going to start thinking about ways that we can modify our behaviorisms. We can modify the way we interact, modify the way we present ourselves. Right? And so, how many of you know of Eminem, the rapper, right? I mean, you know, most rappers are black. <laughs> Eminem is white. So I'm sure there's, yeah. you know, I mean, we, right. scholars don't talk about respectability politics in this way, but he is certainly right. trying. To, he, you know, he wants to, he, he's a talented rapper. He's, sure. a, he's just a very talented musician. But so there are things that one will do under any circumstances to try to, to really fit in, to really belong. We all want to belong. While you were at school, you devoted a great deal of time and energy helping others. You also largely hid the desperate circumstances of your home life from your teachers and your peers. And you put a lot of pressure on yourself. And eventually, it caught up with you. So what I wanted you to share with us, with our audience, do you want to describe the incident that started with James? And then, of course, involved several others. So the way, yeah, I mean, I'll preface this by saying I was a high school student who wanted to do too much. <laughs> One class president, a peer mentor, a student tutor, president of a model UN club, it helped start a math club, wanted to start a philosophy club, was also running track, had a two and a half hour commute to and from school, and still felt like I wasn't doing enough. Was taking three or four AP courses, three or four honors courses. I mean, just creating study guides and trying to create the kind of study guide that every other student wanted to use and every other student <laughs> wanted to rely on. And I'll tell you why I was doing this. It was because when I lived with my mom, my experience at home was often not so positive. It was often very difficult. And any child, you, know, you want positive reinforcement. You want to be acknowledged and seen and you know you want your relationship with your mom to be encouraging and supportive and when I didn't find that at home and I'm I'm glad it, this was the the form that it took because it could take other forms I said okay I'm going to find that at school by being the best student I can be the best student leader I can be the best friend I can be and so the way in which this culminated and probably the biggest error in judgment I've made is that in high school, I reached this point where I never wanted to say no. I mean, I was doing all these things, a student leader in all of these different ways, and anytime someone asked me, Zach, are you gonna create a study guide for this? Are you gonna do this? Yes, sure, I got you, absolutely. I got it, I'm gonna make sure that works out. Never wanting to say no. As a junior in college, toward the end of your junior year, what is the main concern? Applying to college. A good friend of mine asked me, really interested in going to this school, really interested in Brown, really interested in Stanford, can you, can you help? I'm coming from a disadvantaged circumstances. My, my family, my mom and dad don't have connections with college administrators. But my friend wanted to know, you know, can you help me with this? And I didn't want to say no. And because I didn't want to say no, I told him, Yes, I'm gonna do whatever I can to help. I will help with this, because I did not want to say no. I didn't want to let anybody down, because the main source of light, the source of hope, the main thing that kept me going was feeling as though I could deliver every day from nine to three and afterwards at school, being the best student I could be. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna help you with this. And I'm thinking, well, how am I gonna really gonna do this? <laughs> and this was the mistake I made. James I, was the first friend. I, see. I said, okay. He wants to have connections with college professors, and I forged emails. And this was the thing. His parents read it, and they were like, this is great advice. Thank you so much. This is awesome, and this is great. And then the college counselor said, this is great. How did you connect him with this professor? <laughs> and I mean, this was coming on. Then the principal said, oh, wow, Zach is helping, it was at that point, three students. Can I see these emails? And he saw similarities. And yeah, I got caught right here. Uh, I have two more questions quickly, Zach, and then uh, probably we'll leave a few minutes for sure. the audience sure. to ask questions. In your book, you write that, I'm quoting, 
Hiding from race is not an option for black people in this country. Do you think white people hide from race? I would not answer that as a blanket statement. Okay. In part, I mean, part of what my experience with Uncomfortable Learning yep. has taught me, part of what my life has taught me is that the world is complicated. Broadly, I wouldn't say yes or no. I think it depends on the circumstances. I honestly think, I think there are a lot of black people. I won't say most, but I will say many who just, there are times where it's like you just want to forget about race. It's like this thing, I just want to exist right. and succeed and excel and do the best that I'm doing at this thing that I'm right. focused on. Right. I don't want to keep thinking about all these differences. Right. Right. right? On the other hand, there are certainly people who are like, I am committed firmly to fighting racism, and therefore you are thinking about race all the time. So I think it, it's complicated, yeah. and it depends upon the circumstances we're right. looking at. In the epilogue of your book, you mentioned Bill Clinton. And uh, what is the connection that you find between yourself and Bill Clinton? There is no political leader on the most fundamental level with whom I feel like I relate to more. And here's why. Everything I've read about Bill Clinton, I've read over, over a dozen books written about him and his memoir and all of these articles and profiles, you know, any president, all these profiles written about them. And at the end of the day, I felt like Bill Clinton was a guy who was committed to trying to gain a deeper understanding of people, who was interested in people and interested in people's stories, who spent a lot of his time studying people, what makes people tick, what are people really motivated by, what gives people joy, what are their needs, what are their fears, what are their concerns. And that was something, those were questions that had always interested me. Part of the reason why I want to pursue a career in public service is because I am interested in people and other people's stories. I'm interested in finding common ground because I want to work together across differences. And there are many presidents that I admire, a number of presidents I admire greatly. Barack Obama, Dwight Eisenhower, JFK. But when I saw Bill Clinton, I saw someone who invested this unusual amount of time in really trying to understand people. Every person I've ever met who's met Clinton has said, when I talked to him, I felt like I was the only person in the room. Yeah. And I felt like I could relate to that right. from a young right. age. My mom was also a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> any questions from the audience? Any, take any questions? Yes. Uh, your presentation is wonderful. And you Thank have you. a purity of thought that is... Uh, uh, He's having one more tomorrow, by the way, about the book. So yes. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Is the passion of politics on the horizon? That's the question, right? Uh, given the fact that you have such a, a wonderful, uh, clear conscience in terms of the way people should act and behave, and uh, a pure, as I said, a purity of thought. Politics? <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, that's He can be our future president <laughs> one the, day. I mean, the, the, big, the big dream is I, I want to pursue a career in public service. I want to do whatever I can to help people have better stories, to, tell, right. to help people have better experiences. Yeah. And, and I'm interested in policy and being involved and being in the action. So, yes, I do run a run for office one day. And he's uh, studying for the LSAT <laughs> to go to law school. Yes. <laughs> yes, gentlemen in the back. It's a great question. It's an important question. Yeah, so his, his question is, is there a sense that being smart isn't cool, essentially? Being a good student isn't cool. Does it, can it hurt you in your, with your, uh, you know, being cool with your friends? In a sense, yes, it can. And that was part of the reason why when I moved to D.C., and I give my dad a lot of credit for this. My dad was not raised in a family of educators. My mom was, but he understood that I had been attending private school since fourth grade. 
And so when I moved to DC in eighth grade, he said, I want to keep you on this private school track. I want to do everything I can to make sure that you continue receiving a great education. Because honestly, frankly, if I had gone to school in Ward 8 of DC to a public school, the challenges I would face, not really being from the neighborhood, having been a kid who went to private schools, liking reading and wanting to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and this is, it's, it's really sad that, that that's not as encouraged in those environments. Yeah. And so that, you know, students who want to ask questions and who want to read, they're bullied. Yeah. Right. So yes, well, to your question, it's a big challenge. Uh, Paul, I know we ran out of time, right? Zach, I'm happy to stay after and answer any much. questions. He's going to be signing, by the way, books outside. Thank you.